there sort of is a two-way relationship between political freedom and economic freedom. In a way, a growth in economic freedom tends to promote political freedom for the reasons you're citing, uh, as in China now, where there's a, a real protests in the villages about having to, uh, having to have the bureaucrats named by Beijing run them. And there are, are beginning to be elec uh, elections for local leaders in the first steps. So in that sense, economic freedom promotes political freedom. On the other hand, political fr uh, uh, gro uh, you have the situation that political freedom prom uh, uh, promotes a lack of economic freedom, opposes economic freedom, uh, promotes a growth in government. You take a case like the United States. We have had complete political freedom, but uh, the extent of economic freedom has been declining, not increasing. And it's been declining precisely because we have political freedom. So I don't think you can give a simple answer because it's a two-way relationship. No, and I also think it's, there's a fair bit of evidence now that as countries evolve economically, you have a tendency to go toward political freedom. Now, I think you're raising an interesting complication. Once you get the political freedom, there may be forces that are set up that begin to throttle some of the economic freedom, the governments get bigger. And that's why I wanted to move to a, a, a subject where that's the center of the subject. As you know, there's been some opinion in recent years uh, called the end of history, that somehow the oh, whole sure. world had moved and now we've uh, moved toward free markets and political democracy, and that's been the, the goal of all this historical forces and the future looks very rosy. Uh, I can guess your views on that, but I think it would be nice to he hear how confident are you about that and what do you see as the problems in the future? You know, I don't believe that that's valid at all. The, uh, first of all, the people who put out that view have a very generous interpretation of a free economy. For their, from their point of view, as long as you have markets of some kind, it's a free economy. It doesn't really matter how, whether those markets are manipulated it doesn't much matter if the government has extensive controls over those. It's still a free democracy. In the second reason, place, my view of history is very different. My view of history is that it runs in long, long swings. And that uh, the, the question of a free economy is, enters into that. You start with Adam Smith in 1776. It was at a time when you had a highly controlled economy, mercantilist in that case, uh, in which the belief was that the strength of a nation depended on how much gold it could have, and the way to get gold was to keep out the products of other people, but to sell as many, many of your products as you could. Uh, something which was possible for a few countries, but which was self-defeating on the world yeah. scale. Adam Smith started an intellectual revolution uh, toward, a, uh, toward a world of freedom. He would have been in favor, of course, of economic freedom, political freedom, mm -hmm. civic freedom, all sorts. But it took about, what, 40, 60 years? Nine, 18, when were the Corn Laws? 1840s. 1840s. 1840. Yeah. So it took about 60 yeah. years. It took a long time. And then, from then, in the 19th century, that kept going. And Britain really moved toward more economic freedom and more political freedom. But then about... The 1880s or so, you had the Fabian Society formed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what date it is, but it's sometime. Around that time. Sometimes around that time. And intellectual opinion started to shift away from, a, from the Cobden Bright belief mm -hmm. in, in free markets, no tariffs. Uh, and, and as I say, the repeal of the Corn Laws. And you started to have a movement that's already obvious in the early 20th century. Uh, in, uh, uh, toward greater government involvement. Uh, that's about the time when the government took over the schools, uh, and it's also the time when you had the movement toward imperial uh, preference, toward uh, social insurance, so early right. stages mm -hmm. of the social security system. Uh, it's one of the most interesting books I know is a book on uh, 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 the law and public opinion by 
dicey, oh, yeah. Avery dicey. Right, I know. And in yeah. the in the nineteen four in the preface he wrote to the 1914 reprint of his book, uh, he, he essentially predicts the welfare state that came in the 30s and 40s uh, as a result of that. Well, that set in motion, uh, that mo movement set in motion another trend. That trend, which was uh, the main names you can associate with that one, are Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig mm -hmm. Mises, Lionel Robbins, uh, Milton no. Friedman. <laughs> well, a little later, a little later, <laughs> a little later. Right. and that was a movement toward uh, pointing out the difficulties were, which were arising. It was, I think, best encapsulated by the title of Hayek's great pamphlet, "The Road to Serfdom," right. and you, you started to have a, a movement in public in opinion back the other way. But that movement in opinion again, which I would say started oh, at the something like 19, late 30s, early 40s, something probably that late. Mm -hmm. uh, that movement in opinion had no effect at all for 20 or 30 or 40 right. years. But then as government grew, and as the public at large became dissatisfied with what was happening with government growing, uh, you got more and more backing, more and more, it affected the opinion more generally. And finally, around 1980, it started to have a real effect. Uh, with the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall mm -hmm. and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became, you got the doctrine you were talking about. But again, uh, that's a wave. It hasn't worked itself out yet by any manner of means. But when it does, I have no doubt that there will be a wave in the opposite direction that will come along and you'll move back again.